is Dr. Nathan Hogue. Nathan did his undergraduate degree at the University of Victoria, followed by medical school at the University of British Columbia in the Island Medical Program. This was followed up by a five-year urology residency at the University of British Columbia, then a two-year fellowship at management of incontinence and erectile dysfunction. He has a urology practice in Victoria with an interest in erectile dysfunction. He holds a position of clinical instructor with the University of British Columbia Department of Uro Urological Sciences. He is the director of the Island Medical Program, undergraduate and postgraduate urology education. He is a clinical education leader for patient programs with the Island Medical Program and is on the executive board of the BC Urological Society. Please help me welcome Nathan Hope. Thanks for having me tonight. I always like coming here and giving the lectures. Um, receptions are always warm and uh, patients are always interested. So uh, tonight we'll be talking about the treatment of sexual dysfunction after prostate cancer treatment. Uh, it's really a very uh, common uh, concern after the cancer treatment is done. There's sort of other issues that come up and we will try to talk through some of those tonight. Um, this is me, so Nathan Ho. Um, I practice between two hospitals in Victoria, the Royal Jubilee and Victoria General. I have my office on uh, Hillside Avenue. Uh, the phone number is there. Uh, and it was mentioned in my uh, education. I do have a, some interest in erectile dysfunction and, and the treatment of it. I'm happy to get referrals from family docs or other urologists to discuss it uh, in more detail one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so this is sort of my practice. Uh, I would say it was general urology. So there are seven urologists in Victoria. We all have uh, general urology practices, and everyone has <coughs> some specialty interests. Um, and mine would be reconstructive urology, right down dysfunction, incontinence, and the treatment of that. So I trained at uh, UBC in Vancouver to do my residency, and then was down in Melbourne, Australia, to do uh, fellowship, which was two extra years of specialized training. And there's my hospital that I, I worked at when I was away in Melbourne called the Austin Hospital and it's actually called the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Institute. She's their patron. Uh, does a walkthrough every year and, and checks on things and there's myself and a co-fellow and our wives at the Melbourne Cup horse race. And so I'm not here to interview this uh, lecture. Um, I don't receive any sort of uh, compensation but in the past I have been paid by uh, the Boston Scientific Company to teach other urologists how to do uh, penile implant surgery. Uh, sexual dysfunction is so extremely common after prostate cancer treatment, and we'll go into that a little more in, in depth in a couple of minutes. And so what is sexual dysfunction? Well, that can be erectile dysfunction, uh, the absence of orgasms, the absence of ejaculation, painful ejaculation, uh, leakage with uh, intercourse, or sometimes orgasm, <coughs> loss of length of the penis, and the scar tissue in the penis, which can also cause curvature. Some of, the, some of these are very commonly and well known and explored after uh, prostate cancer treatment and some of them are certainly probably less uh, commonly known and only come up afterwards. So what is erectile dysfunction? So this is the inability for <coughs> patients to get and maintain an erection that's satisfactory for sexual activity. So not necessarily just for intercourse but any kind of uh, sexual activity. It's extremely common after prostate cancer treatment, but that said, it's also very common in the population in general. So there's some studies out there that have shown 50% of patients between the age of 40 and 70 will have uh, some form of erectile dysfunction, and uh, certain conditions will predispose patients to having that diabetes, heart problems, uh, anxiety, depression, and certain medications can cause erection troubles. It has a lot of downstream impl implications. So some patients uh, feel that their self-worth is suffering uh, when they're unable to have erections and lead to relationship stressors and breakdowns. So it's a really important area for quality of life to talk about after prostate cancer treatment. So to understand a little bit about erection troubles or sexual dysfunction after uh, prostate cancer treatment, it helps to sort of step back a little bit and have a look at the anatomy of the prostate. And so you can see the, um, the prostate is right here. And all these nerves are very intimately associated with the prostate and, and wound around the prostate. And these are the nerves that um, go down to the penis, they make the blood vessels dilate and they make the erections happen. And so you can imagine that um, by removing the, the prostate, there certainly will be some 
uh, damage to the nerves. And in the same vein, any kind of uh, radiation to the prostate will also cause uh, damage to the nerves. And the picture on the right is uh, showing the surgery. We're trying to peel off the, uh, the nerve uh, bundle, which you can see here is, is uh, sort of yellow. And the nerves aren't always nearly as clear as this when we're doing surgery itself. These are sort of diagrams for textbooks. And just briefly showing the radiation treatment and, and why you will have uh, some damage to the nerves that go down to the venous. As you can imagine, we, with the radiation, they target the, the prostate itself, but there's areas around the prostate that also get a lot of radiation. That includes the, the nerves as well. And so there's definitely collateral damage. And, uh, this graph just sort of shows uh, the rates of erection troubles after treatment. So the red, the red bar is uh, for surgery. So you have two thirds of patients will have some erectile dysfunction that gets better over time. With radiation, it's probably somewhere around 50%. So uh, this is just one uh, study, but there's lots out there showing that there certainly is a relationship between erectile dysfunction and treatment. So how do we treat erectile dysfunction afterwards? So there's sort of a stepwise um, treatment algorithm that we go through, and um, we'll talk about each other in a little more detail. Um, so one would be lifestyle modification. So uh, these are things like smoking cigarettes or drinking too much alcohol that can con contribute. Um, we offer patients counseling or sexual medicine consultation. Um, there's medical management. This is with the oral medications uh, for ED. Uh, vacuum pump device, which I'll talk about in more uh, depth as well. There's suppositories that you can put inside the urethra. Injections that go directly into the penis. And finally, the uh, penile prosthesis or the implant, as it's, it's often called. So in terms of lifestyle modifications, uh, what can we do to help reduce the chance of erectile dysfunction afterwards. So as I mentioned, smoking uh, damages some of the very small blood vessels that go down to the penis. Uh, dietary um, impacts or obesity or being overweight can have impacts. Uh, you know, exercise improves blood flow down to the penis and uh, leads to better erections and controlling the risk factors that we can control. So things like diabetes, high sugars, high blood pressure all do some damage to the, uh, the nerves and the small blood vessels. Uh, counseling, so this is a really important part of it, and in Victoria we have good resources in this department. We have the BC Cancer Agency, uh, has the, uh, the prostate uh, cancer supporting program with uh, certain modules that will help patients uh, go through the, um, the initial diagnosis, treatment options, and then downstream options for, um, for prostate cancer treatment. And one of the modules that they run is the, uh, the sexual function and intimacy uh, group. So that's a good resource for patients. Um, There's also the uh, sexual health clinic, and the Island Prostate Center uh, has uh, some resources as well. Uh, so there's uh, two nurses, as far as I know, uh, uh, Connie and Lana, uh, who are doing counseling at the Island Prostate Center. Um, from what I know, they have uh, demos for vacuum erection devices, online tools, books. So there's a lot of uh, resources there to look into um, to learn more about it. In terms of uh, the physicians in Victoria that do what we call sexual medicine, so one is Dr. Blau, who's a family doctor by training, and she uh, works with uh, men and women uh, to sort of talk through some of the uh, issues around sexual dysfunction. Uh, she'll see non-prostate cancer patients and prostate cancer patients as well, and uh, is really good at uh, sort of delving into issues deeply. Uh, Dr. Correa, is another, she's a psychiatrist by training, practices exclusively in sex sexual medicine, has a very strong interest in erectile dysfunction after prostate cancer treatment. She's based out of Vancouver, but comes to Victoria periodically and, and does clinics here. So um, your family doc or your urologist can refer you to uh, one of those two providers to uh, talk about things further. So I'll talk about the treatments for erectile dysfunction, but I think to step back a little bit and have an idea of how erections are created uh, will help explaining how some of the treatments uh, take effect. So the picture uh, here over on the left uh, shows a penis that's flaccid. The um, blood vessels, I kind of think of them as like a honeycomb type of network of blood vessels. And as the blood flows into the uh, penis, those honeycomb spaces fill with blood and you get the uh, erection. And uh, after treatment, we're not able to get that blood flowing down to the penis. We're not able to keep the blood trapped in the penis, either by damage to the nerves or the blood vessels. So these are the things that we target when we are talking about treating erectile dysfunction. So the medications that are out there on the market are called PDE5 inhibitors. Um, the actual molecule uh, inhibits uh, what causes the erection to go away, or the, the, uh, the 
molecules that take away your erection. This drug uh, stops that process. So it's oral medication. They've been around for quite a while now. And it, it promotes uh, blood flow damage to the penis. Once you do have an erection, it helps keep it. Um, typically, patients will take it about half an hour to an hour before sexual activity. It's not a magic pill, so uh, you still have to have the right mental and physical stimulation to have an erection. It doesn't just sort of work where you take the pill and the erection turns up. And I always try to get patients to try at least two of the different medications before saying you know, these med medications aren't working and moving on to the, uh, the next step in the <coughs> treatment. So there's a few different of these medications on the market. Viagra is probably the best known. It's approved way back now in 1998. Uh, there's three different doses that are available, so 25, 50, or 100 milligrams. I found that the 100 milligram tablets are the same as the uh, smaller tablets in terms of cost, so we'll often get patients that are cutting them up into quarters or halves and just trying that. Um, it works usually, by, it works for about an, an hour or two afterwards. Sorry, it turns out about an hour or two afterwards the effect, so you kind of do have to have some planning. and. Um, the absorption is affected by food, so you can't really take the uh, medication with, uh, with a meal. You won't absorb as much of it, and then you'll have the effect uh, later on. Cialis is one of the other um, drugs on the market. It was approved a little bit later in 2003. Uh, there's a couple different doses that are out there. Some patients take the low doses daily, either two and a half or five milligrams. That just promotes that continuous blood flow down to the penis. And then some patients take five, 10, or 20 milligrams on demand. Uh, it takes a little bit longer to take effect but it lasts a lot longer. And uh, some patients will notice that they'll get effect for sometimes up to two or three days. So this can be useful if there's someone that has sexual activity on a weekend, you can take it on a Friday afternoon, and hopefully they'll sort of see you through the weekend without having to think about it as much. And the other, uh, she mentioned the Cialis is not affected by food, so that's one uh, difference between the other medications that are out there, so you don't have to plan it around meals. Levitra is another one that came out around the same time as Cialis. Uh, it's very similar to Viagra in, in, uh, in its uh, the way it's delivered and, and the absorption. Same thing with that with food needs to be uh, kept in mind. So what are some of the side effects of the PD-5 inhibitors? Well, I do have a lot of patients that complain of, of all of these things. The main one that patients complain about is, is headaches. Let's say after they take it, they get a pounding headache. And the reason is it opens up blood vessels in, in the body. And so you open up blood vessels in the head, uh, in the nose, Face, so you get that facial uh, flushing, you get runny nose, some patients get heartburn. The uh, incidence of what's called priapism, or an erection that won't go away, is actually very, very low with these medications. It's not zero, but it's, uh, it's very uncommon. And really, anyone can try these medications, except for patients that have bad heart disease, especially patients that use nitro spray. So if you have nitro spray at home, or you have a nitro patch on, those patients really can't use these medications. The two of those medications interact makes your blood pressure go extremely low and, and can be fatal. So whenever we prescribe these medications, you always check to make sure uh, you're not on the, um, uh, the nitrates for the, for the heart. What are some of the other treatments for erectile dysfunction? Well, this is called MUSE. So it's a medicated urethral system for an erection. And this is a medication that's actually inserted into the urethra in a pellet form where it dissolves and uh, causes the blood to flow into the penis and it creates an erection that way. There's a small applicator here on the right. You have the pellet and it goes inside the urethra. And you have to say it's, it's really not a very common uh, treatment for erectile dysfunction that we use day to day. Fairly simple to use, so that's one of the good things about it. It's uh, less invasive than doing injections into your penis, but really at the end of the day, it really doesn't work all that well. A lot of uh, patients find it very uncomfortable. It's very expensive and it, it has its whole, whole uh, set of side effects with pain in the area, pain in the urethra bruising, and it can also cause your blood pressure to go a bit, a bit low. So it's not really a very common thing. That a lot of patients like the idea of it because it's not needles or it's not injections into the penis. But that said, it really doesn't work all that well. And here's a couple of pictures uh, showing that what I was mentioning, the needles into the penis. So this is called intercavernosal injections. So this is drying up a small amount of medication, and at home, either yourself or your partner would inject the medicine directly into the penis. It's very simple to do. Uh, it can be extremely daunting for a lot of patients uh, up front when you start explaining to them and they're looking at you funny that they're, you're expecting them to put a needle into their own penis. Uh, but the needles are very, very small. Um, it, it takes just uh, seconds to do and uh, the results can be excellent. So you can see a picture of a patient injecting his own penis. And this is how the needle goes in. We talked about those honeycomb spaces 
you're actually injecting the medicine right into that honeycomb space, and it causes the blood to flow into the penis and, and have an erection. And it usually disappears after an hour or two. Uh, so there's some things about the intracavernous injection that are very good. Um, it's very straightforward to do. The erection comes on usually between 2 and 15 minutes. What I'll usually do is do a test dose in the office, so either myself or I have a nurse in the office that will uh, do the test dose. Um, we usually do teaching at the same time, so we will show the patients how to draw the medicine up, um, how to give the injection, the proper technique, how to clean the penis beforehand, and then do a test dose in the, in the office to make sure that it's working. Um, we usually started at a very, very low dose for all these injections and then gradually work up over time to try and find the right dose. The first few times that we do this, there may be no erection at all. And that's mainly because we don't want to overdo it. We want to give the right amount of medicine in the penis that makes the appropriate erection without lasting too long. So we all started at a very low dose and, and gradually work up. And patients are usually really happy doing this at home. There's a few different um, injections that are on the market. Uh, one of them is called Cabergec, which is just a single medicine. There's Biomix, which is two a combination of two different medicines, and then Trimix, which is three different medicines. Um, of course, the, the, the more simple uh, single medicine ones are, have typically um, certain less side effects, but as you move up to the Biomix and the Trimix, they definitely, definitely work a lot better. You can often use smaller amounts. Uh, so I would typically use uh, Trimix as, as my preferred intercapitalist injection. It works extremely well. Most patients are happy. So one of the good and bad things about the Intercavernosal injections. We get very reliable erections. You know that if you give the injection to the penis, you know the dose you need, you get that erection afterwards. It's a very natural feeling erection because you're really creating, recreating just a normal erection in your own body. Uh, there's no kind of constriction bands that you need with some of the other med medicines that we'll talk about back in a second. And once you get the hang of it, it's extremely easy to do. And as I mentioned, it truly just takes a, a second or two to give the injection. And so, what are the downsides of the intercavernosal injections? You need to inject your penis every time. Um, every time you want to have intercourse or have an erection, you have to inject. Uh, there's side effects that go along with it. It can be painful for some patients. You end up with bruising in the penis, and the blood pressure can go down as well. There's a learning curve. You have to learn to inject it, which can take time. There's the risk of the, I mentioned before, is the priapism, where the erection won't go away, lasting more than three, four, five hours sometimes. You have to end up in an emergency, and you have your urologist put a needle in your penis and try to get the blood out, which can be quite traumatic. You have to refrigerate the medication. So, if you're someone that wants to go traveling, there's, it's liquid in vials. You have to carry a cooler around with you. It can make, uh, especially sort of carry on travel on the airplanes, a bit more of a, a challenge. Or if you're going to be going away for long periods of time, there's that logistic thing to think about. I have a video that shows the actual uh, intercavernosal injection and how easy it is. This is Stacy Elliott, who's a uh, sexual medicine doctor in Vancouver. So, I tried this video. Alcohol swap. We wipe the area clean so that it's sterile. We take your needle that you've already preloaded and you touch and insert all the way, push in the medication and remove. And you hold that spot for at least a minute. And if you're on anticoagulants, it will be two to three minutes. As you can see, it took no more than about five or ten seconds to actually inject the uh, penis. It takes a little bit of time to draw up the medicine in the needle, but uh, myself or the nurse in my office anyways would, would show you how to do that. So some patients are very daunted about the ideas of uh, giving themselves injections, and the needle's extremely small. It's an insulin needle, and I would encourage patients, if you're thinking about this, to really keep an open mind about it, because it can work very, very well and give really reliable erections. So, and what about the vacuum erection device? So some people will, will hear about this, um, I have a picture of the Awesome Powers on there because you really, if you're going to go this route, you truly have to buy a medical grade uh, vacuum erection device. They're not cheap. Uh, you can get them at the sex shop. Most patients just buy them online. The, the Post TVAC or Info Aid, if you typed into Amazon vacuum erection device, there will be several that you can choose from and they'll mail them to you. Um, and so there's, again, some good things and some bad things about this. It, they are a bit expensive. That's one drawback for. Some patients, and I have a, a video of how the device works to sort of help get your mind around uh, what will be expected with it. Insert penis in the open end of the cylinder. Make sure to press the cylinder firmly against the body to ensure a good seal. Finally, press the activation button. Once a firm erection is created, slide the ring off the cylinder onto the base of the penis. Push the red release button to release vacuum. 
When finished, remove the tension ring. The blood uh, gets trapped in the penis. So again, it's a, it's a really good way to get an erection. You have uh, the device, once you get good at it, suck the blood into the penis. That little band keeps it there. Uh, and then, of course, you take it off afterwards. Um, the thing that a lot of guys complain about with this is the erection really stops at the, the base of the penis and doesn't go inside your body. So some patients will say that their erection really feels like a bit of a hinge, it's not as stable. So again, some good things and some bad things. And I've got a few slides that sort of shows a bit about that. So what are the good things about the vacuum pumps? Well, it's, as I mean, it's non-invasive, there's no needles, there's no surgery with it. It generally works very well. Somewhere between 50 and 80% of patients will be happy with it long term. There is a bit of a learning curve to do, but you get know, the idea of it, it's uh, pretty straightforward for patients to use once they got the hang of it. And then what are the bad things? So it's, it can be very awkward, especially when you're learning how to use it. If you can cover something, they have the video, the company makes the video, of course it looks very easy. Um, but it can be pain with the penis. Some patients will say the penis feels very cold and not like their own. You do have to use that constriction device. So once the blood's in the penis, if you didn't put that, that band on, the erection would disappear. So that band holds the penis tight and keeps the blood in it. It can take a while to actually get the erection, so it's really not as spontaneous. So if you decide that you want to have an erection or intercourse and then it takes five, 10, or 15 minutes to actually get the erection going, sometimes that can be a drawback for patients. Um, and they're expensive too. I think they're about four or $500 for a, a medical ready vacuum pump. So as I mentioned, some good things and some bad things about the, uh, the vacuum pumps. And I'll talk about uh, penile implants as well. So penile implants are surgery. So it's really we're going sort of through the stepwise um, treatment algorithm. We talk about medications, the inserts, the injections, the vacuum pump, and sort of, for me, typically the final thing that I would offer patients is a penile implant. That said, the penile implants will, I would offer that to anybody sort of, usually with prime medications, but somewhere further up the stream as well. Some patients typically would like to go straight to this. And again, there's some good things and some bad things about the implants, and I'll, I'll go over some of them. So the implants have actually been around for an extremely long time, about 40 years or so. They haven't changed all that much. I'll talk about that briefly, which is, I think, a good thing. It means that if you had a device on the market for 40 years, you haven't made any ma major changes to it, and it's probably a pretty pretty good design in the first place. And it's a device that sits inside your penis. And again, it seems a bit, and I've got a model back there that um, that you can have a look at if you want to see it. There's also some brochures back there that talk a bit more about it. So it's a surgery that goes inside your, uh, the device goes inside your penis. There's a few different um, penile implants or penile processes that are offered, and so one of them is called the malleable device. So the malleable device is one of the first ones that came out. It's been around since 1974. It's a very simple surgery. It takes about half an hour to do, and the device is extremely easy to use. It would make a decision, uh, either underneath the penis, above the penis or just under the, the head of the penis. These uh, bendable rods uh, slip down into that honeycomb space and then it's simply up and down. So what you see is what you get. Um, it doesn't have any potential for uh, length or girth expansion and um, it's always a rigid device in your penis. And I've got a video that uh, shows as well but there it is sitting inside your body. It is very discreet and when the, the penis is angled downwards but if you're wearing normal clothes, no one would really be able to tell that you have that in there. But it puts con constant pressure on the inside of the penis, and that can cause troubles over time with erosion of this device through, through the outside of your penis. And so the video is actually very straightforward because uh, it just shows a, a man or a, an animation of a man who's uh, using it. So it would just simply be in the, the downward position when you're out and about day to day. And then if you want to have the erection, you still simply would tilt it upwards, and it's ready to go. So as you can see, it's, it, may not be the, it may not make the greatest erection in terms of size because it doesn't have that expansion. It's extremely simple, and you can have an erection ready to go in one second, literally. Moving on, some of the other uh, penile implants that are on the market. So this is called the two-piece uh, inflatable penile prosthesis. And so again, there's some good things and bad things about this. Um, you know, it doesn't have a, an extra reservoir of Fluid, so it's a much more, it's a very simple operation compared to a more complex three piece device. It is more complex than a simple uh, rigid device. It's very easy to use. You have a pump in the scrotum, and you pump up, and that's where the, the uh, fluid lives. Um, and then you, some bad things about this device you don't get as much expansion than a three piece device if you have a uh, reservoir of fluid. Um, and as mentioned,
mentioned, it's, it's also not well, it's not quite as discrete as the three-piece device because there's always a little bit of uh, fluid in the uh, in the cylinders which is in those uh, spaces inside the veins. I've got a video that shows how the um, the two-piece inflatable uh, prosthesis works. Bear with me, I'll just show it to you. I think the animation is helpful because you can sort of see where this uh, where the fluid is going. So as the patient's pumping up the uh, pump and the scrotum, it's sending some of that fluid through the tubing and up into the, um, the cylinders. And those cylinders get rock hard, and that's what actually makes the erection. And then when you're finished with the erection, you give it a squeeze and, then, and that fluid uh, flows back. And then finally, the three-piece inflatable canal prosthesis. So uh, this is the one that's now become more standard of care. Um, it's the one that patients typically are happy with, or most happy with, and you get, because it has um, more uh, saline fluid in the reservoir, you can have more potential for expansion over the length of the penis and the girth of the penis. Of the three implants, it provides the most natural erection and the most rigid erection, and also the most um, lucidity when it's deflated, so it's the most discreet. It does require a separate uh, reservoir, so it becomes a more complex uh, device, so that in that way there's more things that go wrong with it. And you typically would have a reservoir, sometimes by a second incision in the abdomen, or um, sometimes having to go through Canal where the hernia, hernias may be to the abdomen, so we do require a bit more uh, surgery to have that done. I have a video of uh, the three piece device, how it works in that animation, how the fluid travels to, to make the erection. So, as you're pumping the uh, pump in the scrotum, you can see there's a reservoir that sits in the pelvis that's full when it's uh, that baseline, and then when it pumps, that, that fluid goes into the penis. See, it's a bigger, firmer erection. When you're all finished with it, you press a little button on the side, and the penis just deflates and sends that fluid uh, back into the uh, reservoir. So, uh, as you guys mentioned, it's very discreet. And it seems like a lot of sort of stuff to go inside your body, but you can usually get it all put into an incision that's no bigger than about an inch and a half or two inches. And so, what are some of the uh, pros and cons of yeah, implants or prosthesis in general? Well, they typically have a very high efficacy rate. It's a surgery. Um, and so you put the implant in, and if it works as appropriate, then you have a very reliable erection. You have 20 or 30 seconds to get the erection um, created. Typically, patients are extremely happy with it. There are some downsides to any of these surgeries, and it is a surgery, so it requires an anesthetic, it requires to stay in the hospital, usually it can be daycare surgery, sometimes overnight. Um, so there's invasiveness and the complications that go along with any kind of surgery. So things like bleeding, um, swelling and bruising, Typical wound infections, which can become very devastating when you use prosthetic devices. So, if the device gets infected, then the entire device has to be removed. And so, you're back to where you started. And in fact, usually, typically worse because that uh, space that we've created collapses. And uh, after the implant goes in, you're unable, un really unable to go back and have natural erections, either with the injections or the vacuum pump. Uh, there's things like erosion, so because it's a foreign body inside your body, you can erode through the tip of the penis. You can always, uh, during the surgery, there can be damage to some of the, the neighboring organs, so that bowel, the bladder, the testicles can be damaged. Um, and it is a device, it's a mechanical device. The typical uh, lifespan of these implants will be about 10 or 12 years. Um, at about 20 years, about 50% of the um, devices are still functioning, uh, but I usually call patients around uh, 10 or 12 year um, lifespan. So those are some of the things that we talked about. Um, sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, extremely common after prostate cancer treatment. Um, erectile dysfunction, any kind of sexual dysfunction has a significant impact on the patient's quality of life. Oftentimes we deal with the prostate cancer up front, and then some of the other issues like erection troubles, leakage, and incontinence sort of get pushed off to the back burner. And I think it's really important to bring it up with your family doctors, your urologist, because we have lots of really great treatment options for it. And things you can at least try. In Victoria, we're quite lucky. Uh, we have good resources. As mentioned, seven neurologists in town. We have at least the two sexual medicine uh, physicians, and then lots of nurses that are interested in helping patients with erections. So for sure, speak to your family doctor, speak to your urologist. Uh, the Prostate Center can be a good resource in that regard as well. And you know, whatever you want to do, we can help you along that, uh, that pathway. Uh, the family doctors are often very uh, comfortable prescribing oral medications. Um, but when you start getting into things like the vacuum pumps and the injections and the surgery of the implants, 
which they, you'll see a urologist who'll help you sort of through that process and, and try and pick with you what the best treatment might be for yourself. So there definitely are lots of options, and I think it's important to explore it if you're interested. That's really all I had for the slides tonight. Oftentimes with these things, there's tons and tons of questions, so uh, I'm happy to take your questions. And, yeah, this is the Fallacino. This is uh, when I was in Melbourne. They have a big coffee culture in Melbourne, and the, uh, the barista knew who the urologists were, and she would try and make a pinch shaped coffee in our, in our lattes every morning, so it was, it was quite entertaining. <laughs> And so any of the questions that we do, I'm happy to repeat the, the answer, but um, I know it all be kept confidential and you know, then find information. Uh, so I'm happy to field questions about any of that um, uh, sexual dysfunction treatment, right from medications, injections, back and pump, the implant, uh, whatever you have uh, questions about, we can chat about it now. In one of your earlier slides, Nathan, you talked about erectile dysfunction uh, or sexual uh, dysfunction, and one of the categories was erectile dys dysfunction, but there's a number of other categories. Perhaps you could go back to that slide and uh, comment on some of those yeah, other items. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a little tricky, items. obviously. There's, there's, there's so much out there, right, that I'm going to talk about. Like, I've, got, I've had a, given a whole talk on um, subject here with scar tissue and curvature because it's, you know, it's, it's an issue in, in itself so you know with um, both radiation and surgery there's some damage done to the blood vessels around the penis and some patients end up with scar tissue in their penis and they get curvature um, you know, the loss of length is probably not talked about enough before patients undergo surgery or radiation you know, we're, we're doing damage to the blood vessels that feed the penis damage the nerves that feed the penis and so patients probably on average probably lose a centimeter or two of length uh, if they are getting good erections with either treatment surgery or, or radiation and it's probably something that is not brought up enough but urine leakage is, is a big deal um, a lot of patients they don't want to have intercourse if they're leaking and it's, it makes it difficult to be intimate you're, uh, you're worried about it you're nervous am I going to leak when I have an orgasm what's this, this going to be like for my partner so that, that becomes a big thing. A painful ejaculation, so there's some patients I have that have a painful orgasm. Whenever they have an orgasm, it's so incredibly painful, they have absolutely no interest in, in having intercourse or, or orgasms. So I do have a very tiny subset of patients that find the orgasms different in a good way after uh, prostate cancer surgery, but it's probably a, a minority of patients. Of course, absent ejaculation, so if you have prostate cancer surgery, radical prostatectomy, would for sure expect that there be no ejaculation afterwards. Radiation, probably to a lesser extent, but still uh, decreasing the ejaculation, and then uh, some patients aren't able to achieve orgasm. So yeah, the erection troubles are certainly one big part of it, and probably for us it's the easiest thing to fix because we have a lot of different um, things out there for it, but we probably don't talk enough in the office or for treatment about some of these other things that I think can be sometimes almost as big as the erection troubles themselves. Um, the scar tissue uh, possibility, do you know how long, is there a certain window after which if you haven't had it, you're not likely to experience it? So, I mean, it's what we call, it's what we call Peyronie's disease. So the question is, uh, if you have had treatment for prostate cancer, you know, is there a window where you would typically get that, um, and then would you sort of be out of the window, I guess, is the, is the question. Uh, so, Pyrrhonis disease by itself with the scar tissue in men is in about 10 or 15 percent of patients just at baseline. And so with these surgery afterwards, it's certainly higher than that. Probably 20 or 30 percent of patients will have some kind of scar tissue. After about six months, I would expect you probably go back to the baseline or the, the general population. But that would be, I don't know if there's any hard numbers or data on that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, 10 or 15 percent of patients just in general are going to be at risk for having that scar tissue in there. Yeah. Um, post uh, post operation, uh, at what point uh, will you just realize you're not going to get a natural erection? Yeah, is there, is, what is how does is the time frame? Yeah, I mean, so the question is, after the operation, what do you expect in terms of the time frame for recovery of erections? 
we would typically, like I would like to usually get patients a year after um, prostate cancer surgery to say, you know, and, and that's usually where they sort of end up with the final result. Some patients can even be a little bit longer, up to uh, two years. There's a little bit of regeneration of nerves. There's a little bit of increase in blood flow as time goes on. But also that said, you know, if you're not getting a, a flicker of activity and you're six months out or nine months out and really nothing's happening, then I think it is you know, time to explore those different <coughs> options. We talk about sort of more drastic things like, like surgery or an implant, you do want to give it at least some time because maybe you wouldn't actually need that. Maybe you can recover enough with just medications or, or just injections. So just just on that, um, so I, I'm taking Cialis. At what point do you stop taking Cialis all the time because of that? Yeah, it's you're sort of talking about. The question is, you know, if you're taking something like Cialis on a daily basis or what we call penile rehabilitation, the jury's really out on penile rehabilitation. Um, they've done some very large studies, and none of them have come up really sort of conclusive, like this is a sort of slam dunk thing that we should all be recommending to patients. In, in our minds, when we think about treating erectile dysfunction, it, you know, it causes good, healthy blood to flow down to the penis, which can't be a bad thing in theory. It hasn't really translated into sort of measurable improvements. So yeah, after prostate cancer treatment, if you're not using your penis or you're not having erections, you're going to lose even more length. You're going to get even more of that shrinking of the penis. Um, and so the thought is, if you, at least if you're getting some blood flow down to the penis in that recovery phase, maybe it'll look, preserve some of that, uh, that length or some of that potential down the road. So I think most of us are still, if patients are interested in, in erections after surgery, I think most of us are recommending to uh, go on some form of medication. And most patients will need something after, after surgery. And then at a certain point, we'll sort of decide how you want to move up that stepwise ladder. So something like a vacuum pump is really, it almost potentially could be helpful in preserving uh, erections down the road. Because again, you're moving more of that good blood into the penis. You're keeping that expansion and getting the penis rigid and hard and keeping those tissues opening rather than scarring down over time. Do you and recommend like something like Cialis taking it every day? I do that for a lot of patients, yeah. So if patients are interested in preserving erections every day or sometimes every other day, twice a week, just to keep some of that, that blood flowing down there. So I do recommend, I, I think it's probably a good thing to have some blood flow. I think you will probably be in a better uh, place at the end of the day than if you didn't. But as I mentioned, the, the jury's really still out on it. Yeah, you talked about uh, uh, surgery and radiation and how it affects uh, what about the hormone therapy? Yeah, the hormone therapy, again, could be like a whole nother, we could talk for 30 or 45 minutes on, on hormonal therapy. And so that's, it's a, it's a major problem. So when we do hormonal therapy, we're, we're taking testosterone away. And as you know, you know testosterone is what, is what fuels your sex drive. The uh, directions are dependent on testosterone. And so, especially if you're combining these things with radiation, so we're doing damage to the actual Processing itself and the nerves, we're damaging the blood vessels, you're giving it that hit, and then we're taking the testosterone away. It's really a, it's like a two hit thing where you're getting it from both sides. So, um, and again, probably the same thing, it's probably maybe not talked about enough when we you know, get a new diagnosis of prostate cancer or advanced high risk prostate cancer, we have to put you on hydrogen deprivation therapy. And you know, the things that worry about is keeping you alive at first and making sure your bones are healthy and your moves and all the things that can, that can change with it. But for sure, the, the sexual drive, um, the erection cell disappear along with that for a lot of people. Or even if you're taking just the hormone therapy alone, and you've never had treatment, it can be, it can be significant. There are some patients that are on hormonal therapy that have very high sex drives, and some patients, it's very dramatic how much it costs. Any other questions? I'm also going to hang around. Some people may not feel comfortable to ask their questions in front of the whole group, um, so I'm going to hang around for a bit of time and uh, you can just come up and, and chat to me. Uh, oh, we have another question. Sure. Can you can you speak to the cost or how long it's been on the market for the, the three piece, for example? Oh, yeah. So the this is one of the things that we struggle with in in urology. So the only thing that's really covered out of all of this. Is, are the implants. So MSP covers the implants, which are, which are the most expensive to the system, you might 
think, right? Um, so the surgery is covered. Uh, the implant itself is covered. I think the devices are about eight thousand dollars on the market if you had to buy them yourself. Um, in VHA, there's a certain number that they'll fund per year. They have a budget that they, they start with, and they sort of use whatever percentage they, they give us. Um, so that's one thing that's it's fully covered. You don't pay anything out of pocket. Medications are extremely expensive. Uh, the injections are expensive. Um, the vacuum pumps are expensive. So yes, I have some patients that they can't afford any of the other options. They end up going for the, the implant. And some of those patients will be extremely happy with it, but it is a little bit upsetting sometimes when you can't sort of try what the patient may want to try first. So sometimes you end up you go straight to the implant for that reason, for financial reasons. If you've had one implant, it's run its life, yeah. and 20 years down the road, it's had to replace it or remove it, please. Is there a certain period of time where you'd rather the, where the patient has to go without an implant? No, in fact, you want to keep that implant in because it holds that space open. So if you imagine you took that implant out, that space would collapse. And usually when you go back to put a second implant in later, you get a bigger implant in than you had the first time, which patients are unhappy about. Because you've got that, that space has been created and stretched over time. So I do a fair number of, of revision or re-implant uh, surgeries. And just because of the practice and sort of who I took over for practices or historically did a lot of implants. And most of the patients that we do the, the re-implant on, and that can be 10 years, 12 years, 15. I have one patient so over 20 years since his original one. And I have to even look up what that device was 20 years ago, because there's a few subtle uh, changes. Patients are usually really happy with the, uh, the swap out. There's a bit higher complication rate with that operation, so the device has a bit of a higher infection rate. Uh, but that said, it's, it's not a big deal to change it out after 10 or 12 or 15 years. We've got some brochures in the back there to, to talk a bit more about it, kind of go through all these things as well. And um, which I'm always available in three of my office if there's, if anyone wants to meet for consultation one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to do that. If you're a family doc or any of the urologists can, um, can refer you to me. If I do get a referral from another urologist, we usually see those pretty promptly. I mean, because patients have often waited a long time to sort of get to this stage, so we're, we're open to discuss at any time. Thank you, Nathan. Oh, yeah, thanks very much.